And so no clothes, no car, no money. I literally have the clothes on my back. I'm now sleeping on the floor of this like drug dealer, rapper guy. <laughs> My name is Nina Hasty. This talk is as much about a personal brand or a creative brand. If you are a, an artist or a creator or a creative brand, this may not be as clear cut as other businesses because people think that uh, once you're a creative, you have a different set of rules. Uh, but I am a business. Nina Hasty PTY Limited is a business, and um, you can adopt some of these this thinking into your space. Okay, so um, I'm 37 years old now. <laughs> I know. I just like I just like putting my age in, just so that people can be envious. Um, and uh, this is a story of how I fucked up over and over again to get to where I am now. Um, I know that this is supposed to be like a share of one fuck up, but I'm an overachiever, and when I fuck up, I fuck up well. In fact, my own mother said to me, "My darling, only you would excel at fucking up," and it's true. Um, so here's a sort of tantric buildup of about ten years of me fucking up. Um, I was a very bright kid that identified me as a gifted child as a very young age. And they sent me to sort of like an after school center where I got to do like grade nine physics when I was in grade four. <laughs> I know, right? Anyway, um, and then I had a, a radio show by the time I was 13. I, I got my junior black belt in karate uh, and was like a world champion by the time I was 14. Um, I mean, it's crazy. Uh, so between being excellent at everything and sitting on every committee of the school and on all the student bodies, it came to the end of my grade 11 year and where it was time to sort of announce the prefects and the head girl. Now, for those of you um, that have different school systems and don't know what that means, prefects are basically your top students who are identified um, by the teachers and other pupils as students with sort of leadership skills. Um, and the head girl and the head boy are seen as the top students. Um, surely you guys have seen Harry Potter. They have prefects in Harry Potter, you know? So imagine Hermione Granger and Harry Potter were one person. That was me. I was exceptionally annoying, but also really good at life. Um, but then I also got, I never told my mom this, by the way. I got busted for smoking cigarettes at prefects camp. I suspect this is a contributing factor to my first fuck up. But, uh, you know, um, after all of the, these years of grooming and how excellent I was at everything and these expectations of my family and of myself, I was not chosen as head girl. End of the universe. End of the fucking universe. It's like, I mean, because, uh, I mean, this is an important thing. This is the kind of accolade that helps you get bursaries to go to university. My parents hadn't put any money away for my university education, as it was always kind of expected. Oh, well, you know, Nina will get a bursary. She'll go to fucking Yale or whatever. I don't know. Uh, and um, I, I didn't realize that such a personal disappointment would have such a major impact on my behavior and my personality in general. I lost interest in school altogether. I barely attended class. Uh, I don't think I even had a maths book. I mean, I almost failed matric. Like this is from someone who had like 97% for science or something. I, I just, I didn't really care. So this is fuck up one. I then decided I was no longer going to be a rocket scientist. I had uh, listened to a major, uh, I had listened to Lauren Hill's uh, Miseducation of Lauren Hill, and I decided I was going to become a rapper, uh, much to my parents' chagrin. This is fuck up too, right? So <laughs> the decision to become a rapper is a fuck up on its own. In my first year out of school, some pretty shitty things happened to me. I'm a victim of well, all in all, three uh, very violent sexual assaults, but the, there's two that sort of happened within six months of each other at about age 18 or 19. Um, and due to me being a bit of a dick to my high school friends, they all kind of had cut me off prior to this. And I didn't really, so I didn't really have any friends and I didn't have anyone to talk to about this. And I probably should have spoken to my family about it, but these things happened to me on nights that I had snuck out of um, the house without their permission. And I was so terribly afraid of being in trouble for that. I, I never spoke about it. So I just kind of put it in this corner of my brain and let it fester, which then set off a whole another like 
a whole lot of behavior because uh, I was in a lot of pain and I didn't realize it. So that's fuck up three. Um, the fear was in the wrong place. The fear shouldn't have been about uh, talking about it. The fear should have um, been about, you know, well, actually, I don't know what the fear was, but the fear, the, the fuck up there was not talking to my family and not going for therapy and not dealing with it because this then changes my behavior even further. I'm 19 now. So please don't feel sorry for me at this fucking place. Look at me and my life is beautiful. Please don't go into the stage where you all start crying now, I can't deal. All right, um, at this stage, I'm now 19. I, I get scouted in a freestyle outside a hip hop club in Pretoria. I know, right? I'm there, I'm rapping. Um, there's this hip hop DJ, he has me rapping. Uh, and after not too long, I'm on tour with this sort of sponsored corporate campaign, traveling around the country, rapping about their products. It was for MTN. They had this free to speak campaign. Guys, imagine fiber optic cables, all MCs are able, or whatever the fuck. I don't know what I was rapping about, but um, my rap name at the time was MC Nasty because if you take my initials, N-A, hasty, and you say it quick, it's McNasty, <laughs> right? Anyway, so, um, so now, not long after this, uh, I get this job at Sony Music, as in Sony Music International. This is 2003, I'm about 20 now. Um, I am responsible for doing the PR for all their international repertoire. Beyonce's debut album, thank you. <laughs> that was me, okay, just in South Africa, and we didn't do too well at the time because urban music actually wasn't popular in South Africa. Anyway, at the time. Um, by 2004, Sony and BMG were merging and they were um, restructuring the business at Sony. Uh, I wanted to resign, but I got this counter offer for them to ask me to stay and head up their local hip hop division. I said, no thanks. I'm going to go start a record label with my boyfriend because as you may or may not know that when you're 21, you make decisions with your vagina. Anyway, um, during the course of this relationship, I meet a bunch of standard comedians, Joey Razdin and Lois Ogola. Uh, you might know him. He's kind of famous in the world now. Uh, anyway, so Gola says to me, Nina, you're really funny. You should get on stage. And I did. I feel it. I fall in love with the craft. It becomes my number one hobby. I stop with the rapping. I stop with the DJing and all the other kind of shit that I was doing. I'm like obsessed with stand-up comedy because there's nothing quite like it. So, but it starts to interfere with my relationship and my business. Um, also, I, do, I realize I don't want to do PR for rappers and other people when really I'm actually quite talented and I want to learn how to write and produce funny movies. So it's 2006. I break up with my boyfriend. I move back home with my parents in Pretoria and I go to film school. I'm, I'm running comedy nights and comedy events and I lose a lot of money on one event. There was a lot riding on that event. And that was supposed to pay for my second year of varsity. I run out of money. They won't release my results. I can't pay for my third year. I drop out of varsity. Fuck up number four. So now um, I get back to Johannesburg. I land up getting a job as a marketing manager for a mobile content company selling ringtones for subscriptions. Um, SMS, sir. <laughs> Anyway, Peach, Ma Peach Mobile, Standard Lala. Anyway, uh, whatever, you won't really just forget about that. Anyway, I get called in. Um, <laughs> thank you. I get called in at the office because I was drunk a lot of the time, or I was like still drunk when I'd, I'd wake up, like go to work. And my bosses asked me to go to rehab. Uh, this is the first time my drinking and drugging kind of interferes with my life. So one day, and I was like, no, fuck you guys. I don't have a problem. Also, you're not paying me enough money. Also, I hate this job. Uh, so I just like pack up all my stuff and I resign. And very dramatically, I'm like, this is not my dream. You people are not my dream. Anyway, and I book a flight to Cape Town. I get a job as a waitress so I can do some stand-up comedy in the Cape Town comedy circuit. I don't remember much of this. It's a bit of a blur. There was a lot of drugs and whiskey and cocaine involved. Sorry, mom, I know you're watching. Um, I get very depressed uh, at this stage and I beg my mom uh, to send me a ticket to come back home because I'd lost everything again. Fuck up number five. So now I'm back in Pretoria. Um, I'm a mess. My parents asked me to to leave because, you know, I, I think I was just driving everybody. I was just terrorizing my poor family. Anyway, I'm now couch surfing. I stay a bit with friends. I piss those friends off. I try living in Joburg. 
I'm staying with people. I'm just on like a two year binge. It's somewhere around 2010. All of this is a bit blurry. I actually have to go and do some research because I don't really remember a lot of this. Um, but I do remember that it was the World Cup because there were these two Argentinian soccer fans who were really hot. That's an irrelevant detail. Anyway, so uh, between 2010 and 2011, I'll end up losing everything, everything, okay? Um, I'd say this is a series of fuck-ups between six and eight. It's, it's a bit difficult to tell. I lose my car because the landlord of the place I'm staying at took all my stuff because I hadn't paid. So, and he'd put all my clothes in that car, like everything. So uh, they'd sort of taken it all from me. So no clothes, no car, no money. I literally have the clothes on my back. Um, I'm now sleeping on the floor of this like drug dealer rapper guy's trap house. If you don't know what a trap house is, basically it's just like where like people get together and drink codeine and try and make hip hop music. Ugh, it's disgusting. Anyway, so I'm sleeping on a floor. Uh, there's no bed, there's no blankets. Um, I'm actually kind of, I think I had a bit of a Stockholm syndrome uh, cause now I was actually ugh, this is so disgusting, but anyway, um, I'm now sleeping with this guy and, uh, he's kind of won't let me out of the flat. He won't let me work. He won't let me leave. He won't let me make money. Every time I try to leave, he sort of beats me up. Anyway, one night he kind of beats me really badly. He bursts my eardrum, all the blood vessels in my eyes. Uh, no one really tells you, um, that that's what happens. I always say like, Oh, I've got a blue eye, but really it's red eyes when someone hits you really hard and all the blood vessels burst in your eyes you have red eyes it's the most horrendous thing um but anyway i i i realized that this guy was going to kill me and and i had to leave um even though at the time i i mean it's stockholm syndrome you're in love with your captor it's like a crazy fucking thing anyway by some miracle, there's this money that comes into my account from a voiceover I had done about six months before. And I'd also, in the meantime, had managed to get my grand's fucked old Golf 1 that I was driving my car back from that landlord guy. And I, I got to drive it to the airport at like 3 a.m. I was drunk um, and I had to wait for a 5, 5 a.m. flight to Cape Town. Um, when I, I'd fallen asleep on the plane, I'll never forget this. And I woke up. And I didn't know how I got onto an airplane. It was fucking crazy. Anyway, so um, uh, I then arrive at my aunt's and uncle's, my aunt's house in Cape Town, beat up these blue eyes and a mess. I've got nothing. I mean, imagine how terrifying this must have been for this woman and my uncle and my cousin. I mean, it's terrifying. Um, anyway, they take me in for about two or three weeks. I get a waitressing job. Um, and they also now, I like, they're also sick of me because while I'm at this waitressing job, I naturally destroy my relationship with my aunt and uncle and lose the waitressing job by week three. I'm now cut off from my family. I think they must have had a meeting without me. Or I don't know what the situation is, but everyone was like, don't give Nina any money. Nina must sort her own shit. Everybody's cut me off. Um, I've run out of favors in Cape Town. Nobody wants anything to do with me. I've couch surfed. So I was like, shit, what am I going to do? I remember sitting on the side of the street and going, I am so fucked. I don't have any options. I don't know what to do. Anyway, I then like walk up and down like Long Street and <laughs> this is so crazy. And Kloof Street, there's this place called Cafe Paradiso and they're part of the like Madame Zingara family. And they're like, okay, Nina's one of those people that's probably going to do well in the circus. I joined the circus. You, I can't make this shit up, people. I joined the circus, right? Um, uh, circus is called Madame Zangara. It's like, it doesn't have animals. It's like a theater performing circus. It's a moving tent that travels around the country. They didn't think I was talented enough to be in the show itself, but I was allowed to waitress at the circus. And every night you dress up into different things. I had little outfits. I was like a little drum majorette uh, or like little red riding hoe or whatever. Um, uh, so I joined the circus and I have this accommodation at a place called, called the Dodge Lodge, where I share a bunk bed with two other girls in a room. It was this tiny little space, maybe like three meters by two meters or whatever. And three of us shared this like bunk bed situation. And um, uh, we actually made a lot of money for a waitressing thing, but that helped me keep my drug and alcohol habit alive. Um, then one day when I was at the circus, I had passed out in the garden of the Dodge Lodge, face planted into the grass, and I was still dressed up in my, I think, little red riding her outfit anyway. And I took my wig off. And as I took my wig off, this like big clump of hair fell out. 
right? And over the next month, all my hair falls out, like just like completely lose all my hair. And my dad, I think at that time, had just been diagnosed with cancer. I think that was quite traumatizing on, on me for, because having not spoken to any of my family, I was like, oh, fuck my dad. What am I going to do? Yada, yada. Um, and I phoned my family one more last time and I begged my mom, please, can I come home? And I think seeing me with all my hair falling out, they kind of realized, okay, maybe, you know, maybe this time she'll really like get it together. And they, they promised, I promised I would get my shit together if they gave me like a month of sanctuary. They're like, okay, you can stay for a month. Don't get comfortable. My alopecia got worse. My eyebrows, my lashes started falling out. My, the hair on my arms and my legs started falling out. Um, maybe I should have found a photograph just so you could guys, okay, hang on a second. Please wait. We appreciate your call. Uh, Casey Bolt. I'm just going to do this. I'm going to find an image. I'll share this with you. Um, okay, cool. Hang on. I'm going to share the screen for a second. Uh, all right. Can you see this guys? See that little baldy over there? My lashes hadn't started falling out yet. Oh, well, maybe the lashes had fallen out yet. But anyway, so this is this is Baldy, Baldy Mapaldi. So I, I my hair started falling out. So that's quite crazy. Um, anyway, and um, yeah, so my mom and them were like, oh shame. Okay, cool. You can come home, don't get comfortable. Then, guys, there's hope, right? I get this phone call. That's life-changing. Nina, will you be a part of the South African cultural contingent to go and perform at the 2012 Olympics in London? Are you kidding? Absolutely. Yes. Anyway, so I get my bald ass onto a plane and I go, I come back and after not long, you know, then I do the thing, Olympics, fucking a wonderful look, Nina, you can do anything. You're out of this thing where you're fucking up. Now, of course, your first overseas trip, you're actually literally being paid to go and perform at the Olympics. I mean, it's very Nina. Um, Anyway, I come back. I I had not. I had been like trying to do the sober thing on my own, um, but I didn't really get it right. Obviously, there was something wrong with me. I come back, and I'm now drinking quite aggressively. And this is the last fuck up, the fuck up that I can't possibly come back from. I'm like even taking like very heavy drugs. Um, I get this phone call from a friend of mine, but I'm still staying at home now. But I think my mom is on to me with the drinking and stuff, and it's. It's just really so difficult. It puts my family under so much pressure. Um, I get this phone call from a friend of mine and she's like, Nina, I have a drinking problem. Um, will you help me? Will you take me to an AA meeting? And I was like, yes, yes, girl, you have a drinking problem. Pfft. Talk about projection. Anyway, um, so I, uh, that was the 16th of October, 2013. I sat there, I went to this meeting. I realized, oh shit, she doesn't have a drinking problem or whatever, that's her shit. I actually had one. So I was like, okay, cool. And this is where we get to the crux of the situation. That was the last fuck up. Guys, I sat and I looked at my life and I, I really assessed it. I was like, I am fucked up. I have a drinking problem. I have a drug problem. I, I'm a complete utter disaster. How do I fix this? I'm a, I want to be a stand-up comedian. I want to be living my life, but I have to like really look at myself and go, okay, cool. This part is not allowing me to access my brain. I need my brain to do my job. I need my brain to be a Nina Hasty, to be a performing artist, to be a voice artist, to be a comedian. That's what I need to do. And if I want to go be a comedian, I need to run my life like a business. So what did I do? I did a SWOT analysis. I did a brand plan. I did a business plan. I found an, an investor who like checked out my whole plan. My mom came with me to the meeting and eventually I got the startup money to start Nina Hasty PTY Limited. At the time that was 22 and a half thousand rand. Um, that's about a thousand pounds. And now my company, Nina Hasty PTY Limited, is an international brand. I'm currently serving clients at, like Viacom, NBC Universal, Multi Choice. And, um, you know, I've made a few million rants in the last couple of years. And, uh, but the point here is, had I not lost everything, I would never have gotten to the point where I truly needed to make such a thorough and sustainable business plan and to really look at the entire industry as a whole and go, okay, cool, where does Nina fit into this? Who is my competition? How can I do this? And I can tell you now, because of that, I sustained the COVID crisis. I managed to get through all of this stuff as a, as a top tier artist because I was also like, 
what's the fucking worst thing that's going to happen to me during COVID? I lose my house. I lose everything. Honey, I've already been there. Uh, there's nothing to fear. It's not as bad as you think. So at, during this COVID crisis, I wasn't making any fear-based decisions. I was just making strategic decisions and managing my anxiety and my, my machine, which is my brain. Um, but yeah, so uh, I'm now one of the you know, foremost comedic voices in the country because I didn't have another choice. That's my talk. Merry Christmas. Have you ever failed in a project, career, or business? Whether you have or not, you can become a Fuck Up Nights organizer in your city, company, or university. Learn how at fuckupnights.com. Join the movement. Fuck up the system.